But uh, Luke chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 21 and read to the end of the chapter. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form, like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age. Being the son, as was supposed of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mephat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jani, the son of Joseph, the son of Mattathias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Esli, the son of Nagai, the son of Math, the son of Matthias, the son of Semain, the son of Josek, the son of Jodah, the son of Jonan, the son of Risa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Kassim, the son of Elmadam, the son of Ur, the son of Joshua, the son of Eleazar, the son of Joram, the son of Mephat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Eliakim, the son of Meliah, the son of Mena, the son of Matatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Joseph, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salah, the son of Nishan, the son of Aminadab, the son of Admin, the son of Arni, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Serug, the son of Reu, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Pharxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalil, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, and the son of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and pray that you would speak to us through your word, through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as a, as a new church, um, I think we can still use that new church, young church, um, we preach the books of the Bible because as Protestants, as Reformed, as Presbyterians, as Evangelicals, we believe in the authority of Scripture and that to know God, you have to know His Word and you have to know Scripture. And that's good on paper, but the, the Bible is a, is a pretty thick book. Um, it's, there's a lot in the Bible, if you're, especially if you're doing uh, a year through the Bible reading, you realize that there's a lot of stuff in the Bible, a lot of names. We just read through some. There's a lot of names in the Bible. There's a lot of stories uh, there's a lot of poems, there's a lot of history, there's a lot of literature, and there's also a lot of doctrines in the Bible. There's a lot in the Bible to know, um, and a lot of doctrines, theological truths, theological statements. And some of those theological doctrines, some of those theological statements are easy to believe. You read them, and, oh, that's pretty easy to believe, that's, that's great. But some of them, in a, in a big book like the Bible, some of those theological statements, some of those doctrines are hard to believe and difficult to believe, if we're honest. And so I want you to think for a second, is there one doctrine, one theological truth in the Bible that you know is true, but you kind of struggle with? It's hard to defend. It's hard to believe. Is there one that you think of? That is kind of hard to believe, hard to defend. Or imagine you're talking to someone at work or someone in your neighborhood or somebody uh, who, who you know, a relative maybe who's not a Christian, and they ask about this particular doctrine that you're thinking of, and you think, I don't know how to defend that. I don't know the apologetic for that. Um, or I'm a little shaky. I hope they don't bring up that. Um, is there one doctrine you can think of? There might, there might be one. There's you know, several. I mean, the doctrine of creation has been a very controversial one for a century now, um, really going back to the, um, um, the Auburn Declaration in, in the early 20th century where Christians, Presbyterians, struggled over the issue, and, and other Lutherans and Methodists, Baptists, struggled over the seven days. Is, it, is Genesis 1 and 2 poetic? Is it science? What is it? That's, that's one that Christians have struggled with sometimes. Maybe that's one that you're not sure about. Or maybe it's one we talked about a few weeks ago, the virgin birth. How could, how could God be born of Mary? How does this happen? That's one that um, I think I mentioned a story with a, a former president of medical university who I was friends with. He lived out on Kiowa. He passed away a couple years ago. And, and Hal, Dr. Howe would say, Ben, you can't believe that. Science. I said, Hal, you're, you're talking about a creator. 
So we, we, can, we can give him some room to operate. Uh, but Hal had trouble with that. Maybe it's the doctrine of the incarnation. How could the infinite God become finite man and become like one of us? Maybe that's a doctrine that is hard to describe. Another one, this, this is probably maybe more common, definitely is with Presbyterians and other denominations. Um, do we choose God or does God choose us? Do we have free will or does God sovereignly choose some to life and choose some to death? That, that's a tough one. Um, and, and a lot has been written. And a lot of people have spilled ink on paper to describe how that's not true or isn't true. Um, I remember uh, in seminary, I was at Gordon Conwell Charlotte. I went to see a Methodist friend who I was in class with. He, he was a preacher. He had a couple little Methodist churches. And so I went to one of his churches one Sunday morning to visit just because he was a friend and, and um, just to hear him, hear him preach. And he, I think I can say this. Uh, his, his dad was there. His dad... Um, is a high-ranking Methodist, I didn't know at the time, a high-ranking Methodist official. And when I walked out after the, church, after the service, his dad was there, was there visiting, watching his son preach. And his son said, hey, this is Ben. He, you know, he's, he goes to Westminster Prez. Uh, he's here to watch. And not kidding, I mean, I was not picking a fight. This guy came up to me and says, you think you choose God or does God choose you? And he picked a fight with me on the steps of a small Methodist church. Uh, and I think that was, that was Rock Hill. That was a little, little Methodist church in Rock Hill. Uh, so that's a controversial one, and I, I did not engage him, and actually his son came in and stepped in to deflect, because I was just there for, because I was, didn't want to go to Westminster that morning. Um, to be honest with you, <laughs> kind of fed up with the pastor there. Uh, or there's other doctrines, that's a tangent, sorry. Uh, there are other doctrines that are hard to defend, or hard to understand. One of them is the doctrine of the Trinity. That may be one. That is hard to describe. How do you understand the three and the one, and the one and the three? How does that add up? In the West, we kind of emphasize um, the one. In the East, they kind of emphasize the three. How do, how do we defend the Trinity? Because Judaism doesn't have the Trinity. Islam clearly does not have the Trinity. Buddhism, Hinduism, all the isms do not have the Trinity. It is unique to the Christian gospel. And it was important in the early church to understand and define it. But really throughout history, it's been such a hard, this is a simplified version, it's been such a hard doctrine to understand and defend that in many cases, really throughout the medieval church and into the Reformation, it was kind of forgotten. It wasn't really talked about. It's a hard doctrine. Sometimes you understand, is it important or not? And really, it was a forgotten doctrine. Even in the last few hundred years into the, into the 20th century, the, the doctrine of the Trinity was hard to defend, hard to talk about, and so Christians often didn't talk about it. They didn't see the relevance of it. They didn't see the necessity of it. And so if you look at, for example, the 19th century, the most influential theologian, the father of liberal theology today, which is an issue, uh, Frederick Slermacher, he wrote an influential systematic theology book, and you won't find much on the Trinity until you get to the end. There's a little footnote, a little end note about the Trinity, because it wasn't important. What was important the last 300 years in Christianity was ethics and the brotherhood of all. And that, that comes from the Enlightenment, all that kind of stuff. But the, the doctrine of the Trinity really has been a forgotten doctrine, really until the beginning of the 20th century, early, early 20th century, when people like Karl Barth and, and Moltmann and others began to study the Trinity and talk about it and wanted to, wanted to, want to defend it um, and have an apologetic for it. So the last 100 years, you've seen a little bit of resurgence in talk about defense of the doctrine of the Trinity. Because that's a hard doctrine to talk about and understand. You know, is it like a water where it's a cube and it's, it's frozen and it melts? And it, is it like that? Is it like a triangle? Uh, what is it like? And it's like none of those things. Those are all really bad ways to teach the Trinity to, to people because it all airs to one side or the other. This morning in our text, we have a primary text for the doctrine of the Trinity, for what we believe about the Trinity, what the Scripture teaches, because you have all three persons of the Godhead acting in the work of redemption here. This is about 28 A.D., give or take a year. It happens at the baptism of Christ. You have the three persons of the Trinity working. This is the economic, what we call the economic Trinity, the Trinity in action. And it happens primarily at the baptism. So this morning we're going to look at what happens here at Christ's baptism. And then we'll look briefly at the end about this genealogy, why it's here, how it's, why it's important, why does Luke tuck it in here, all that kind of stuff. But really we're going to learn here about the Trinity here. So John, if you look at your text, John tells us about the arrest of John. And he, he mentions, we talked about that last week, and then he mentions that all the people were coming to the wilderness outside of Jerusalem to be baptized by John. And this is a baptism of repentance of, for sins, uh, forgiveness of sins. And so the crowds are coming. Remember we talked about this. This is 
This is Billy Graham style, George Whitfield style revival in the sense of numbers. This is a big crowd, and they're leaving Jerusalem, coming out to the Jordan River for a spiritual renewal led by John. And this is easy to miss. I want you to notice what Luke does. He very casually, I mean, it's like Luke's writing with a cup of coffee and just casually glosses over this. He says, and Jesus Christ had been baptized after Christ had been baptized. And if, if you're a Bible student, you would say, wait, Jesus was baptized. Why was he baptized? And who baptized him? John just kind of, or Luke rather, sorry, just glosses over who baptized him and why he did it. And so Luke has a very casual, informal approach here that you'd kind of want to know more. It's interesting, first of all, that Luke does not tell you that John the Baptist baptized him. You don't find that in your text. You find that in Matthew's gospel. You don't find that here. And the reason is because Luke is trying to, after talking about John, he's trying to downplay John so that you can focus on Christ. So he does not tell you that John baptized Christ. That's intentional. That's a theme you see throughout the first few chapters of Luke, which is that John is, is important, but not as important as Christ. And, and you see Luke write about that here. We learn that John baptized Christ in other Gospels. Um, interestingly here, this is the only encounter we have recorded between John and Jesus. I mean, they might have hung out all the time and, and had coffee all the time and walked around the Sea of Galilee a lot, and, but we don't have any record of that. This is the only encounter we have of them together. And really later on, and Luke will cover this down the road, later on when John's in prison, he'll send messengers to talk to Jesus, but those are intermediaries, those are followers of John. So this is really the only encounter we have of John and Jesus, and Luke doesn't even tell us that John baptized him. Um, and here people are, you know, when, he, when John is in prison, he sends those messengers. It is in response to the question of what Luke addresses here, which is, are, are you the Messiah, Jesus? Are you the guy we're waiting for? And John, that's a letter from prison. That is a message from prison. I'm about to die here. Am I dying for the right guy? Uh, is what John is, is saying. But the larger question for Luke here that he gives us is, why was Jesus Christ baptized? If it was a baptism for forgiveness of sins, for repentance, the question should be, as you read this, why was Jesus baptized? Why was that important? Did he need to repent? Did he need to have forgiveness of sins? This is kind of an important question, and a question that really, even since the early church, the patristic church, had to discuss and debate why this happened and why Christ was baptized. And we don't, there's some explanations. Maybe he was trying to affirm John's ministry. Um, Some people said, yeah, maybe Jesus Christ did need to repent. That seems to be a a wrong answer uh, from the rest of Scripture. Um, One answer is that he was a disciple of John, so he's following John in obedience. Uh, Maybe it was symbolic. We really don't. One guy says, we just don't know. That was one book I had. I'm like, why did I buy that book? because you don't know. Uh, You're supposed to know or give me ideas. Um, I think there's at least a couple reasons, and we know one reason, honestly, from Matthew chapter 3. It says that Christ came and lived under the law. The law of God is what God has told you to do and that you don't do and I don't do. What he's told you to do, Christ came and lived under the law to fulfill all righteousness. We learn that in Matthew chapter 3, verse 14. So what does that mean? He fulfilled all the law, fulfilled all righteousness. It means that everything that God demanded of his people, which meant listen to John and obey John, Christ did. He fulfilled all of the requirements of the law. All that God ordained to happen, Christ did it. Theologians call that the active obedience of Christ. All the things that you and I are supposed to do, all the things that Peter and, and, and John and James, the disciples, were supposed to do following the law and did not do, Christ does. That's his active obedience, so that nothing will be lacking in the life of Christ. And that is important because he has to offer a perfect sacrifice. He didn't live in isolation for 30-something years and then offer that perfect life on the cross. He lived a perfect life. He fulfilled all the law, including obeying the main messenger God had sent, which was John, and obeying John's command to be baptized. And so he does everything demanded by the law. So he's, his active righteousness is found in his life and his ministry, including being baptized. So he's fulfilling the law of God. I think another reason, why, and this is important here, why Christ is baptized by John is he is identifying with God's people. He is identifying with you. 
He is becoming one of them, and that's important because when Christ goes to the cross, he is going as a priest. Remember in the Old Testament under Moses, a priest would take a dove, a pigeon, a lamb, a goat, whatever you had, depending on, on your wealth, depending on your income statements, your tax returns. Whatever you had, you offered different levels of animal, right? We talked about that a few weeks ago. Christ is not offering an animal. He's offering his life. The priest doesn't take a lamb or a goat or a dove. The, the priest offers himself. And so he's identifying with God's people because he is dying on behalf of them as a member of God's people. And so this baptism identifies him as one of God's people. Really, if we had more time, we'd talk about the idea of he is the true Israel. Israel means the son of God, the one who wrestles with God, the son of God. Christ is the true Israel. That's why he goes in the wilderness, because Israel went in the wilderness and failed. Christ goes in the wilderness for 40 days, and it's perfect, and follows the, the law of God. So that's why, he's, that's why I think he's baptized. I mean, it's a tough question. Why would he do that? But that, that seems to be the most theologically the most accurate uh, reason for why he is baptized. And then look what, look what happens next after the baptism. Luke, again, is just very casual in this. It's easy to miss, but it's important. He says, after the baptism, Jesus is praying. Jesus is in communion with God the Father. And he's praying, which is a theme in Luke's gospel. We talked about it maybe two months ago when we started the gospel of Luke. Luke records more instances of Christ praying than any other gospel writer. Luke records more types of prayers, more accounts of Christ praying than Matthew does or Mark does or John does. And so what he says here is Christ is praying. And it's as he's praying at the baptism, only Luke tells us this, that these three significant things happen, which is what we're, what we're looking at this morning at the baptism. Three significant things. Christ has been baptized. He is now praying. And then three things happen. And these three things are signifying that God is stepping into history. He is stepping into creation in a visible, tangible, um, apocalyptic way, eschatological way, end times way. Something is changing forever at this point. And so three things happen. The first thing is this. It says the skies opened. The skies opened. And that, that is a, a, an apocalyptic theme, end times theme, eschatological theme. I uh, think of Isaiah 6, where Isaiah receives his call. Um, and, and he has a vision, and he, he is allowed to see into, beyond, into the throne room of heaven. And then Isaiah 64, which we read part of that earlier uh, in, our, in our bulletin. Isaiah 64, 1 says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens, tear the heavens. That's what's happening here at the baptism, and come down. And the mountains might quake at your presence. What Isaiah is saying there in Isaiah 64 is that when the heavens open, God is speaking, God is acting, God is revealing himself, revelation, that something is happening, and God is revealing himself to his own people. Same thing in Ezekiel 1, where Ezekiel receives his call to minister to people who are being hauled off to Babylon. Same thing you see in, in John, in, in the book of Revelation 4, John 10, John 11, John 14. He sees visions, heaven opens. It's a sign of God acting to bring about his work in the end. And so that's what you see here. The sky opens, the heavens open. It's an apocalyptic theme and something that the early church would have been familiar with. Because even 250 years before this happened, there's a, a, a writing called the, the Testament of Levi. And it's, it, it gives an account of, of this type of thing happening when God would act. It says, quote, the heavens will open, and from the temple of glory, sanctification will come upon him. And with a fatherly voice from Abraham to Isaac, the glory of the Most High will burst upon him. That's what's happening here. So that is a common theme motif in, in this, in this uh, time frame of when God acts, the heavens open, the sky is open, God is acting, something is changing. And so that's the first sign, that something is happening here with Christ that is unusual and unlike anything that has ever happened. The second sign that we see here is it says, The Spirit of God came upon him visibly like a dove. Visibly like a dove. It doesn't say he was a dove. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit was a dove, but it says the Holy Spirit was like a dove. So again, a simile. This is, he's not an actual dove, but like a dove. And this is an interesting picture because if you think about the Old Testament, can you think of an example where the Holy Spirit is portrayed as a dove? If you can think of one, then you should be up here preaching, because I, I could not come across one. Um, the dove in the Old Testament is, is equated with peace and with, uh, and with Israel, actually. The, the closest you can get, really, is Genesis 1. Uh, there's a Jewish uh, commentary or targum 
that talks about at creation, it says in Genesis 1, the, whole, the Spirit of God hovered over the chaos, over the, uh, the watery chaos of creation. And there's a Jew, Jewish commentary uh, written before this, actually, that says that the Holy Spirit was acting like a dove at creation, hovering over all of creation. So it's an interesting image. But what I want you to notice here is that the Spirit of God is different from Jesus. The Spirit of God is different from the Father. And the Spirit of God is, is not an impersonal force, this ambiguous force. The Spirit of God is a unique identity, a unique person who acts uniquely from Jesus, who acts uniquely from the Father. That's what's happening. And the Holy Spirit comes upon Him to empower Christ to teach, to empower Him to preach, to empower Him to heal people, to disciple. It will empower Him to with, um, withstand being stripped and beaten and tortured and executed. And it will be the Spirit of God acting with the Father who raises him, Romans 8, from the, from the tomb. So here you see two, two of the events that God is acting to bring about something totally unique. The heavens open, the, the Spirit of God appears. And then the third event is the voice of God is heard. That's the third event. The voice of God is heard affirming the divine identity of who Christ is, just as the angel affirmed it. And so the God who planned redemption for sinners... He now speaks to announce the identity of who Christ is. He speaks to announce, this is my son. This is who he is. Know who he is. Don't be mistaken. If you look at your Bible, I'm guessing a lot of your Bibles have a little footnote. I'm looking to see reactions. Yes. Yes. Okay, at least two of you have Bibles that have footnotes. Most of your Bibles, I looked at a few of mine, uh, have a little footnote that says something like, and some manuscripts add, quote, Today I have begotten you. That might be in your Bible. Um, just want to take a second on that because that's an important thing to note. Um, that presents a challenge because if, if, you're, if you're putting that in there and it says, Today I have begotten you, does that mean that at his baptism Christ became God? And you might think, well, Ben, we're Presbyterians. Westminster doesn't tell us that, confession of faith. But really, throughout the history of the church, this has been a, a, a um, heterodoxy theme teaching unorthodox teaching that has crept up repeatedly, which is that Christ became um, divine or was adopted, adoptionist theology. If you remember, we talked about that a little bit in our early church history course. Me me and Ed were talking about it over a couple weeks with the Ebionites, Theodotus in the second century, who said he was adopted by God the Father, and Christ was a really good person who became this person at his baptism. That is still, you still hear echoes of that in some mainline churches, to be honest with you today. You still hear that. And the, the Christian church has said that is denounced. That is not true at, at Nicaea in 325. And, and the reason is not because we don't like it. It doesn't add up and Calvin didn't teach it. That's not the reason, although those would be good enough for me. The reason is because that little footnote that you have comes about in the 5th century. 5th century with Codex Beze, B-E-Z-A-E. 5th century, that's added. The earliest and best Greek manuscripts, without getting too kind of esoteric here, do not have that anywhere for four centuries. We don't have that. So it's clearly a late addition, but yet it's important to realize that 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 is there in in a lot of people's Bibles and and taught in some different, um, different churches, and it can mislead people because it might take away from the divinity of Christ. And, and we were talking a few weeks ago, Ligonier Ministries out of Orlando, Florida, they do their every year, two year their theological survey. Most Americans don't think Christ was God. I think it was like 54%, something like that, 56%, something like that. Most Americans don't believe that Christ was divine and would point to passages like this and say, well, we do have some manuscripts. Um, one prominent writer, and I'm, I'm going to moderate my comments here on this guy, but one, one professor, Bart Ehrman at UNC, uses stuff like this to push an anti-Christian agenda to say that Christ wasn't divine. And, and the, these manuscripts here that are footnoted in your Bible um, tell us that. And it misleads people. And he's been teaching at UNC for 20-something years, misleading people. Uh, I remember having a, having a discussion with a friend who's, another friend who's passed away. He was an older guy. Um, this was seven, eight years ago, a guy named Norm. And Norm... Uh, lived out on Kiowa, and, and he read a lot of Bart Ehrman's books, and he, he went at me one time in a Bible study and said, Ben, you're too hard on Bart Ehrman, and he's a good scholar, and why are you beating him up in Bible study? And I said, and I, this is honestly what I said to him, I said, you should go to Barnes & Noble, back when there were still a lot more Barnes & Nobles, and I said, just look at the book titles 
in, in the Christian section by Bart Ehrman. And true story, he did. And when he came back, he said, Ben, I think you got a point. And I just, I went and looked this, this week, his book titles, Lost Scriptures, okay? Uh, Lost Christianities, a conspiracy theory book. This guy's a professor at UNC. Misquoting Jesus, the story behind who changed the Bible, okay? God's Problem is a title, okay? That, that might be your problem. Uh, another title, Jesus Interrupted, Revealing the Hidden Contradictions in the Bible. Another, another book title, Forged, Authors of the Bible Aren't Who We Think They Are. Uh, another book title, these are all, I mean, you can buy these if you want, don't buy them, but you could. Uh, another title, The Other Gospels, and then finally, uh, How Jesus Became God. That's pretty clear what he's saying there. And he uses passages like this that have that little footnote from Codex Beze in the 5th century to say, You've been misled, and he's been teaching students in Chapel Hill for 20 years this. The guy's a fraud. The Bible is clear that Christ did not become God. He is God in the flesh. He took on humanity. He did not become adopted. Um, and, and documents like, like this one that are kind of thrown in there, I mean, the ESV shouldn't even have that in there. Take away from that and bring about doubt. So if anybody does ask you or if you come across someone who's had that kind of teaching, you need to know, and this is an apologetic point here, I guess, um, it's, not, it's not in the best manuscript, it's not in the earliest manuscript, so don't believe it, even if a PhD from UNC tells you that. Don't do it. So here at the baptism, to back up, back, back up for a minute and get a big picture of what we're seeing here, you have three persons of the Trinity. This is a Trinitarian passage for this doctrine where you see the God the Father, the author of redemption, speaks God, the Holy Spirit, the one who applies redemption, is descending. And Jesus Christ, the one who accomplishes your redemption, is receiving that. He's hearing and receiving that from the Holy Spirit. So you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're all present together as Jesus begins his ministry. They're all present throughout his ministry, and they will all be present in the ministry to redeem sinners from sin and from death. That, that is a huge part of what we believe as Christians. And here you see that doctrine, a doctrine which is... is Hard to defend it sometimes and, and hard, to under, hard to understand it much of the time. It's, it's clearly taught here. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together in one um, covenant of redemption, as theologians of the Reformation would call it, a uh, covenant of redemption. And so what we see here after that, Luke then is thinking about his writers who might have doubts about what's going on here. Uh, and, and Luke gives us affirmation about the identity of Christ by bringing in this genealogy. And we're just going to spend just a couple minutes here on this as, as we finish this morning. He brings in the genealogy of Christ, the ancestors of Christ, to show that while Jesus Christ is the Son of God, we see that as baptism, he's also the son of Joseph. He's also the descendant of David, meaning he will fulfill the covenant given to David in 2 Samuel 7, a covenant that will be a king on the throne forever, a Davidic king, a king from the line of David. Luke is saying he is the guy from David. So while he is the son of God, we see that the baptism, he's also the son of David. More often, or moreover, he's also the son of Abraham. Because really, when you get back to the big promise God makes, forget the word covenant, the word promise. God makes a promise to Abraham in, in Genesis 15 and 17 about, I will make a people for myself that will scatter around the world and they will be my people. Christ is the descendant of Abraham who fulfills that. And so we won't spend a lot of time on the genealogy. There's about 77 people listed here. If I spent more than five minutes on that, I know some of you would be checking your watch, um, or s snoozing on me. Um, so we're, not, we're going to spend a couple minutes here uh, this morning as we finish up. We don't know a lot. A lot of these names aren't listed in the Old Testament. 30, I think 36 names are not even known. Uh, a lot of them aren't in the Old Testament, so we don't know much. So there's not much to say. But there are a couple things that are important here um, to know. First, again, on the, on the apologetic front, if you compare the names here to Matthew 1, where there's a genealogy, the names are different. Some of the names are different. Actually, 38 of the names are different. And so as an apologetic, some people have said, well, there's a problem in Scripture. I'm sure Bart Ehrman has a book on that somewhere too. Um, this, this was noticed by the early church. This isn't something a professor anywhere has figured out in the last 100 years. The, the Christians of the early church knew this and have looked at it, and there's all kinds of ways to look at it, meaning maybe there was an adoption present uh, in, in Christ's, um, ancestors. Maybe there was a, a levirate marriage, meaning if you had a, a, a brother who's, who died, the widow would be married to the, uh, the brother who was still alive. There's all kinds of ways you can do that. Maybe, he's, maybe one, Matthew is following Joseph, 
Luke is following Mary. Maybe one's following Joseph and Mary. So there's all kinds of ways to try to piece it together. We, we don't know, but the names are different. And if, if someone, uh, you talk to someone who doesn't believe in Scripture and they point to this, just say, hey, Christians have known this for roughly 2,000 years. Uh, it's not a problem because the names don't line up. There's different ways to get to the ancestors. The second thing to, to add on the genealogy before we finish is that Luke works back to Adam and God from Christ. If you look at Matthew, Matthew begins with Abraham and works up to Christ. Luke goes the other way around. He puts it in reverse and starts with Christ and goes back to the Son of God, Son of Abraham, Son of God. So he does it in reverse, which is interesting. And then the final thing this morning is why does Luke add it here? We've already been introduced to the birth of Christ, the birth narratives, the infancy narratives, the announcement narratives of Luke 1 and 2. Why does he put it here? It seems kind of awkward. And I think what we're doing, what Luke is doing here is this is very similar to what happens in Exodus chapter 6 with Moses. You're introduced to Moses, you're introduced to Aaron, he's called, he's commissioned. And then in Exodus 6, you get the background of who Moses is. I think maybe he's echoing a little bit of, of uh, Moses' genealogy because Christ is the, the final Moses. Moses, when you look at the Old Testament, he is the guy who towers over everybody. Because he's basically a king, he's kind of a prophet, he is a prophet, he's kind of a priest, he kind of does all the three offices, more or less. Um, Christ is the final Moses, he is the true Moses, he's greater than Moses, and so it's done in that way. But he's also, what Luke is trying to say here, is that while he is divine, and you see that at the baptism, what Luke is trying to say is, Christ is not like the Roman and Greek gods who were like half man, half God, the demigods of the Greek and Roman culture, he's not like that. That's what Luke is trying to say. Luke is trying to say he's not like what you read about in Greek and Roman mythology, where you have this kind of amorphous part human, part divine. What Luke is trying to say is he is fully divine. That's the baptism. He's also fully human. That is why we can trace him. He was actually born. He's got parents. He's got grandparents. He's got great-great-grandparents. He's got a family line. So he's trying to really affirm what later theologians will call the hypostatic union. Fully God, fully man. Hard to figure that one out, but just it's, it's true. And so Luke is, is showing us he's fully God, fully man, and the Trinity, the triune God, is working in a plan of redemption put into act. The imminent Trinity, the Trinity as it is apart from us, is acting. The economic Trinity is acting to redeem you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he's fully God, fully man. Christ is fully God, fully man. And it's because he is that he can go to the cross and suffer and die. And as a human, he is going to feel that pain when they, really, they take his clothes off and they just beat him. I mean, we, we kind of gloss over that a little bit at Easter when we get to the, the passion narrative sometimes, but they take his clothes off and they just beat him. I mean, he's bloody and he is fully human. He will receive that and hurt. He is fully human when they whip him and when they take hammer and nails and put his hands and his feet on a wooden beam. He's fully human. He receives that. He, he feels that. And he does it not because he did anything wrong, but because you and I need a Savior. We need a Redeemer. We need someone to go to the cross for us because we can't do that ourselves. We won't make it. We won't make it. And so that's what, what Luke is showing us. The, 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 the Trinity is in action, and Christ is empowered for that ministry through the Holy Spirit, and that will lead him ultimately to the cross. And that's what we have this morning at the sacrament. We have the, the body and the blood of, of Christ signified and, and sealed through this sacrament uh, to strengthen us uh, this morning in our faith. Let's pray.